So this is uh, five minute talks. As a reminder, you do have a total of five minutes. Um, if you are going to use any technology, that includes that part of that five minutes. So uh, we can turn the document come on if you would like, but uh, just keep that in mind as part of your five minutes. Um, in addition, uh, don't forget to sign up for five minute talks. We do have sign up sheets in the back of the room and outside of the main uh, ballroom here. So if you have something you'd like to say, we do have two more five minute talk sections, one this afternoon and one tomorrow morning. So feel free to sign up for those. I'm going to read the list of speakers for this session of five minute talks and to kind of keep the ball rolling. If you're the next person in line, if you could come up and stand on the side of the stage and be ready or come up and sit up front, that would be great so we can get uh, the, all the talks in that we would like to in this session. So we're going to start with John Shea and then Sarah Marie uh, Bel Belcastro. The third talk, uh, we're missing a, a name of the person, but we have a title, E plus ER. So if someone would like to talk about that, it's a mystery. Uh, PJ Couch, uh, Lee Mahavior Peterman, Harry Lucas, Caroline Mahavior, Brian Katz, and David Scher. So we'll start with John Shea. Good morning, everybody. My name is John Shea, and I'm a third year PhD student at Iowa State University. Uh, the title of my talk is M Cubed for BCV at Iowa State. Um, and that's a picture of our. Um, the building that housed our program. I'm part of the bioinformatics and computational biology graduate program. And um, just to start with the quote that I found in a book that I recently read um, called The Moore's Method. And I think I saw it also on a bookmark uh, at one of the desks uh, tables. And to me, I think this quote rings really well. And it says, the Moore method is I'm convinced the right way to teach anything and everything. And today the presentation is about, um, we're trying to design an introductory bioinformatics and computational course, uh, undergraduate course at Iowa State University and trying to apply the modified Moore's method. And we feel that this is a very ideal setting for um, the application of the modified Moore method because uh, this class will have very small class size with under 30 students. I think right now we're looking at about 10 to 14. Uh, students will come from a diverse background of both computational and biological backgrounds. And the great part is um, we have a couple of instructors, including myself, uh, that have both computational and biological background. And this is important because what is bioinformatics? Um, I know there's a lot of mathematician here, but um, bioinformatics, I pulled this off of Wikipedia, the source is full knowledge, I guess. Um, bioinformatics in, is an interdisciplinary field that develops method and software tools for understanding biological data. So the part of the development is very important when we want to train students um, to have that um, inventive kind of um, mindset coming into the field. Um, this field of bioinformatics um, gathers students from all sorts of um, disciplines from both the computational side as well as the biological side, so um, mathematics, statistics, computer science, engineering, as well as um, various biological sciences, including molecular biology and um, protein people. But we merge it into this field of bioinformatics to then solve problems such as sequence analysis, expression analysis, so just a lot of big data type of analysis. Uh, I'll have an example question later on, but typical questions would be like, for example, if you're given two sequences of, uh, of an organism and you're trying to see how related they are, for example. So the course objective will obviously introduce some bioinformatic concepts. You can read the list there. But um, we really care about development of bioinformatics skills, uh, including basic programming and scripting, use of databases, um, obviously know how to do a sequence alignment, but as well as just general problem solving skills so that they encounter, because this field is constantly evolving and changing. A typical question that we are thinking about right now, for example, um, this is, for example, if you're trying to build a sequence, this is for a genome assembly, you're trying to put together a De Bruin graph, for example, and you are given a transition matrix and you're trying to figure something out. This is a classic stochastic problem, stochastic, stochastic pro process problem. So what is the probability of reaching a node C starting from node B in 100 steps? And this uh, kind of challenges the student and it's very doable, but um, the implication of solving this stochastic problem has a lot of implication in terms of error correcting and genome sequencing as well as putting graphs together. Um, ultimately, what we want to do is train students that um, don't freak out when they see uh, big data that comes through the pipelines of, from um, genome sequencers and be able to solve and avoid being that really freaked out guy there. Um, but um, what we propose in terms of how we're going to modify the traditional Moore's method is that 
Uh, we're going to treat a pair of students, uh, one biological and one computational background, uh, as a single unit. Um, and encourage students to scour the internet. It's kind of hard to tell students not to use the internet at this point, but we want to definitely enforce the fact that they use proper citation in this case. Uh, there is definitely going to be a midterm and final project in an official course book. Because we're an interdepartmental program, some of the departments really require this to have this on the syllabus. Um, but a majority of the grade will still be coming from the problems and solving problems and presenting problems during class. A uh, student will turn in exercise solution prior to attending class. This is an introductory class. We want to make sure that you know, we develop good habits for the students, as well as they will receive points for showing up. So just kind of encourage students to continue to show up for class and participate. And finally, I would like to wrap up by um, acknowledging uh, my co-instructor, Dr. Caroline Lawrence Dill. Um, as well as my major and co-major advisors, Susan Lamont and Adriana Dobbs, as well as um, Dr. Cornette, uh, who introduced the Moore's Method to me and told me to read this book. And I really enjoyed it, and I'm really excited about designing this course. And definitely thank EAF for helping sponsor part of this trip. And I will be available around and during the coffee session, so if anybody have any thoughts about applying IBL towards a non-traditional course in non-mathematics, I guess, um, feel free to find me and talk to me. Thank you. Next up, Sarah Marie Belcastro and E plus ER and PJ Couch are next. Um, so Mathily stands for Serious Mathematics Infused with Levity. It's a five-week intensive summer residential program for very, very high ability high school students. We have seven hours of class per day in two sessions. It's entirely IBL. Um, there are lots of summer programs, but we're the only IBL all the time program that we know of. Um, the material ranges over college mathematics and graduate mathematics. Uh, the lead instructors are PhD mathematicians with IBL experience. The apprentice instructors are undergraduate and graduate mathematicians. Um, they teach under supervision. They get daily coaching. They have pre-program training via meetings and readings and stuff like that. So here are four new things I want to share with you. One, we're starting a second program this year. It's called Mathily Er, which is for Mathily but earlier. That's for younger students and slightly less sophisticated students. Um, the first director and lead instructor there is Jonah Ostroff. And the first apprentice instructor is Alice Mark, who might be in the room or might not be. She's a finishing grad student at UT Austin, and she's involved because two years ago she heard me give this uh, little five-minute thing and then approach me afterwards, and so now she's involved in it. So you too can be involved in programs like this if you want to by approaching me, and I'll put you on my rotating list and stuff. Um, they're going to have one class this year because they're starting small. Uh, item two, the application pool for Mathily and Mathlier has totally grown. So first year it was whatever it was, and then it was 150% the next year, and it was 150% again this year. Um, we are ending up admitting 30% of the completed applications to Mathily, and of the applicants that have gotten sent on to Mathlier, that's about 40% admission rate. Uh, Mathly is having two classes, two simultaneous classes. Um, item three, I've written instructor training documents. I'm giving a quote unquote presentation on them tomorrow. If you want to help me revise the documents, please come and help me revise the documents because that's the point of the session. And four, um, unsurprisingly, after students have IBL intensive experiences, they're like, where can I go and get more IBL, either as a senior taking college courses locally or when I go to college. So if anybody wants to help me figure out a way of compiling a list of institutions slash individuals at institutions that I can tell people about when they ask me these things, please do, thanks. Any questions? There might be a minute left. Okay, no questions. Talk to me later if you want. E plus ER, if that's a thing. Am I once? No, so PJ Couch. Okay, um, so uh, Ms. Behavior signed me up for a talk and I didn't know until just now. Um, her brother actually signed up for a poster presentation and had me do that without telling me beforehand either. So uh, that must be just a behavior thing, I don't know. Uh, so yesterday I saw uh, Dr. Parker's talk and one of the things he pointed out was that a lot of times our strengths are really close to our weaknesses and he gave a few examples of that. So one of the things that he asked us to do during his talk was think about what your strengths are, think about what your weaknesses are. And one of the things that really stuck out to me was, in a very real way, my biggest strength is also my biggest weakness. Um, I'm pretty forthright, uh, pretty straightforward. 
So one of the things that really seems to be effective with my students is that I don't necessarily have to have everything planned out ahead of time. I'm pretty quick on my feet. The problem with that is sometimes somebody says something and I'm quick on my feet with a smart ass answer, right? <laughs> so when I do stuff like that, sometimes some people just really get turned off by that. But what I found is almost everybody really, really likes that about me and the people who really don't like it really, really don't like it, right? And then just like Ed Berger said yesterday, the fortunate thing about that is they don't have to take calculus from me, right? So that's one of the things that really stuck out to me was when you're talking about your strengths and weaknesses as a teacher, sometimes, again, as you said, when you're trying to figure out how to um, maximize the benefits of your class and minimize the sort of repercussions, you have to make sure that you're have, you have a balance. Am I willing to minimize these costly errors that I'm making at the expense of the endearment that I'm getting from the other students. Okay. Um, anything else? <laughs> All right, lesson learned. Sign up for your own five-minute talk or your friends will start signing you up instead. <laughs> Uh, or maybe your enemies. So, uh, Lead Behavior Peterman is next, followed by Harry Lucas. I'm, I'm Lee Behavior Peterman, and I am announcing the donation to the Archives of American Mathematics of my father, William S. Behavior's papers. Um, I have, uh, since he passed in 2010, um, my mother has honored me with. Um, letting me sort through his papers, and I have annotated them with hundreds and hundreds of post-it notes and cross-references. If you're, I'll say, older than me, your name may be in there somewhere. Um, and uh, these have all been donated to the Briscoe Center. There's a flyer in the, the room 301 you can pick up and um, it tells about the Archives of American Mathematics. Um, this was a gift of my mother. Would, Mama, will you stand up? And um, I don't know that everyone knows what a help and support she, she was to my father's success throughout his over 50 year career. Uh, starting with she typed his dissertation. Um, he, she found an error in a proof he did after his colleagues had said it was fine, and that was several decades into his career. Um, she listened to him every day talk about both teaching and mathematics, and together they produced uh, me and my brother, who went to grad school in mathematics and became successful teachers of mathematics. Um, my father got his PhD in 1957 from R.L. Moore. He uh, published um, significantly in topology. Um, much with uh, Tom Ingram, he uh, did a lot for advancing the area of inverse limits. Um, he was very involved and interested in discovery learning. Uh, he mentored other professors in IBL and he published in uh, teaching as well as in mathematics. He was on the EAF advisory board for some years. He was very involved with uh, EAF. Um, there are videos of his teaching, which my brother notated, and they, um, they're highlighted in the um, EAF newsletter that's in your packet. That's, that's Daddy right there. And um, <clears throat> these videos are, are online, free to look at. Um, <clears throat> in fact, that was the last semester that he taught. And um, tonight, at the, um, you've been invited in your packet to the R.L. Moore house. There's a map. And um, 
at that house is uh, the Mahavior Conference Room, which was dedicated a couple of years ago to my father. So, wow, my dad got his PhD here at the University of Texas from Dr. Moore. He and Mama moved into a little garage apartment in 1953 here in Austin, and now his name is in his professor's house, the Mahavior Conference Room, and his papers have come home. Do you have any questions? I have a minute left. <laughs> okay, um, my father's legacy lives on. I'm very proud and happy. And um, again, I'm announcing that my William, the William S. Mahavior papers have been donated to the Archives of American Mathematics. So if you're interested in history or topology, you can contact the archivist or me as to what's in there. Thank you. Barry Lucas and then Caroline Behavior. Those posters were outstanding. I wish we could have kept those up somewhere closer by. Uh, I've got about three points, and including some thank yous, but first referring to Ed Berger. He, you know, when he was young, he attended this 96 planning meeting at the Hyatt, he said. Well, if you are present today at 445 in this room, you might be able to say, I was there at the beginning. That's number one. More will be, more will be revealed. Uh, number two, I want to thank give a, a, a series of thank yous here, and I've, I'm going to have to, our list is so long I had to write it down. So first, the main thing for Norma and her team, Norma Flores. <laughs> and that team includes Corin, who's back there, Judy, Robin, Chris, and Thane Brock, who makes the money to make a lot of this possible, is Thane around. He was here yesterday with his daughter, helping out. And of course, Albert Lewis, who was here at the beginning, way before the first planning meeting of the Oral Moore Conference. Albert, you're around somewhere. Yeah, he'll keep up with the history, too. Thank you, Albert. Coming up to the present, Bill Hamilton and Tina Straley were doing some excellent work uh, on the planning for the future. And of course, Ron Douglas has been in with us ever since, uh, well, over 10 years and, and has done an excellent job of communicating and coordinating with a lot of things that have, you'll find out about some of them at, in 4.45 this afternoon. Uh, the leadership team, that's a smaller group and we have a big leadership council. And more will be revealed on that later. There's some pretty good names in there, including two members of the National Academy of Sciences. To this group, the, all the presenters, and especially TJ, Angie, the program committee, Victor, and all the section leaders, what a great job. This is the best conference yet. Okay, that's my second point. I hope I didn't leave anybody out. Now, the, the third point, this is not only for my nostalgia and my memories, but uh, Gary Richter gave a really interesting talk yesterday afternoon on R.L. Moore's geometry. Uh, 
Lee Mahavier's father, Bill Mahavier, wrote a section uh, in the Oral Moore biography on page uh, 366 on, in modern language, what Moore's five courses, the main elements of Moore's five courses. Under 624, it's titled Introduction to the Foundations of Analysis. This was the first, well, the second, this is the second year, in other words, the first course after the first year calculus. And to me, you know, I kind of found my voice there for the first time. So if this thing could be transformed to the present in modern lingo in a modern format, that might be an excellent first course for math majors and introduction to proof. Others have done this before. Bing has the top topology of the line and plane. Martin Brown, same from Michigan. Mike Starbuck. All had versions of this. And it was very, it was single valued functions in the plane. And it was ge from a geometric standpoint. There weren't a lot of formulas at the beginning. So to conclude, I'm requesting that some potential visionary leader that's here give a five minute talk or a session here or at MathFest or JMM on Dr. Moore 624 in a modern format. So I'm thanking all of you for all that you do, and especially to this person I just referred to in advance. Thanks a lot. Caroline Mahavier and Brian Katz. Hello. Um, some of you may be wondering why a girl who's literally younger than this 18th annual conference is coming up and talking to you. Well, let me tell you, I am the granddaughter of Bill Mahavier, who received his PhD under R.L. Moore. And more interestingly, I took Calculus I from my father, Ted Mahavier, in the spring. And it was my first IBL course after going to these conferences my entire life and hearing him talk on and on about IBL and more method and kind of believing that it was effective, kind of not. Well, I told him at the conference, the JMM conference in the winter at um, San Antonio, well, I'm about to put you to the test. And let me tell you, I did. So one of the things a lot of people ask me is, what was it like having your dad as a professor? Well, I'll give you a little anecdote. One day I went to his office. I had a problem that I'd been struggling with from his notes, and it had been kicking my butt. And I walked in there and asked him a few questions. And as a kid who went to public school, I was used to being spoon-fed information. I was used to going up to a teacher and asking, what's one plus one? And then going, oh, it's two. Go away. So I asked him. I don't even know. It was some kind of calculus problem, I'm sure. And he, he instead of helping me, told me, the beauty of mathematics is the struggle. The beauty is that you will be working on a problem for months, maybe even a year, maybe half your life. I'm only 17, so that wouldn't be too long in retrospect. But um, so he told me that the beauty is the aha moment after months, weeks, years, so on, of working on a problem. The beauty is the aha moment when you, it finally clicks when everything you had been working on just comes together and it makes sense and you see the bigger picture. I had never thought of mathematics in that way. I had always just seen a formula. I'd always just seen one plus one equals two. So he told me, get out of my office. And I ran off and scurried around and worked on the problem. And I did get it. And I did try to present it the next day. But one of the problems I found with the way he set up his IBL course was presentations. Whoever had the least presentations raised their hands. Multiple people had the same problem. Whoever got the least presentations uh, got to present. I, of course, was at the board every single second I could. I want to run up there. I want to show him. I want to show everyone. I knew calculus. I can do this problem. So I had 17 uh, presentations within a few weeks, whereas some kids had two. 
So the kids who had two got to go and present before I did. And they would go up and botch a problem. And I may seem sweet with my curly hair and my freckles, but I'm very cutthroat in classrooms. <laughs> I want that problem and I want to present it now. And so whenever someone raises their hand and they have one presentation, whereas I, has, I have 18, and they get to go present the problem, I'm just sitting there mad. I'm just sitting there, oh, he, he added this wrong. He took the derivative wrong. I want to ask him a question. I want to throw him off. But of course, that's kind of mean. So I kind of just sat there angrily. And um, so that was one of my problems with the way he set up presentations. People who didn't actually know what they were doing a lot of the time went up and stole my problems. And that's my grade, because presentations in his class, is, that's 50% of your grade. Quizzes at each, each week, we had a quiz that we turned in a paper that explained a problem as you would explain a kindergartner. And I believe it was Einstein who said, you, you do not know something until you can put it in words simply. And I loved it. I loved it. I, loved, I wrote him five page papers on how to take a derivative. It was beautiful. I just wrote on and on. I'm sure he got tired of me. He probably saw my name and was like, I don't even want to read her paper. I'm going to find every problem wrong with it anyways and not give her a perfect score. But to each his own. Um, one other problem with the IBL course that I had as a student was you fall behind really fast. And that's because six students are going up to the board each day and presenting their problems. It's bam, 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 bam. OK, we're on to the next topic. So and there wasn't a book. I referred to um, Dr. Berger's videos on calculus a lot, actually. I don't see him, but thank you, wherever you are, uh, <laughs> to catch up sometimes, because even the best fall behind. So it went on really fast, because everyone was explaining their own problems. Um, sometimes people who didn't thoroughly grasp calculus, the problems they were presenting went up there. So I wasn't sure I understood what was going on, because they went up there and explained a problem. So I got confused. But other than that, I think I'm running out of time because she's going to come kick me off the stage soon. And it was a wonderful course. I do not want to learn mathematics any other way. I can't wait to go to another IBL course. It kept me active. It kept me excited. And it kept me in the back of the room going like this whenever I saw someone doing something wrong. And I wouldn't have known they were doing it wrong unless I'd learned something. So I guess I learned something. Thank you. We have time for one more, so Brian Katz is going to go last in this session. Hello, everyone. That was pathetic. Hello, everyone. Hi. Good. Uh, so I have three things for you. First, an announcement, then a thank you, and then finally, a challenge. So the announcement is, after this, we have a half an hour break. And then after that, you'll come back in here uh, for the roundtable discussions. It's one of my favorite components of the um, of the conference, and uh, what's going to happen is there'll be uh, titles for courses laid out on the tables. You sit down at a, at a topic where you're most interested in speaking with your colleagues, and we'll work on sharing resources about teaching those particular courses. Uh, those of you who have been here the last several years, I have um, attempted to do something vaguely meta IBL while doing this. So, two years ago, there was a we sort of practiced having a large group discussion during this. And last year, we, we focused more on um, how to, like a structured task for a group. This year, there will be descriptions of roles for each person to take. So asking individuals to take certain kinds of roles during these discussions. And the, the particular focus of this one is to make sure that the, the voices are sort of balanced, to make sure that everyone gets to participate. So that's my, uh, oh, great. So that's my first one. The, the thank you is, uh, Many of you know Elizabeth Thorne and I are uh, co-editing a special issue of Primus. And then there's a, another IBL special issue that's in the works. I think that's TJ, Angie, and Dana. And together, we got over 40 paper submissions, which involves over 120 reviewers, mostly from this community. So I just want to say thank you for the interest and thank you for the work. Uh, and TJ says they still need more. Uh, I can't take any more. <laughs> okay, so now to now to my actual uh, challenge. I we are here talking to each other about how to do IBL better, and and maybe people who are already interested how to how, interested how to how to get started. Um, but 
Mike Starbird asked an interesting question at Ed Berger's talk last night, which is, why would somebody else start? Like, what was the initiative that, what incited the change at Southwestern? Um, and, and I think what we need to, to think about is people who are articulating other problems, things that they're working on, and they, they wish they had methods to accomplish their goals that we can help with. So, um, this is too big, but... These are the uh, practice standards from the Common Core. I think you're probably familiar with these. And when you read these, you think, oh, well, these people are saying we should teach with IBL and we should prepare our teachers to, uh, to be able to teach IBL in the classroom. So, and I think there's already synergy in, these, uh, in this community where we're preparing our teachers to do this work and we're thinking through this lens. And the, the, the big voices in Common Core and math are aware of the, thing, the kinds of things that we're doing and we, that one is already there. I would like to make you aware of one other that I'm recently become aware of. Um, how many of you are familiar with the, the LEAP challenge coming from uh, AAC and you? A little bit. LEAP stands for uh, Liberal Education and America's Promise. And some of the, uh, the goals, commitments here. So LEAP Vision includes a commitment to essential learning outcomes, high impact practices, uh, value assessments, which are um, sort of valid and very well built rubrics, uh, and inclusive excellence. So that's sort of the goal here. Um, if we look back. So liberal education prepares students to understand and manage complexity, diversity, and change. Students who experience and engage liberal education gain broad knowledge and in-depth knowledge in a specific area of interest. They develop high-level transferable skills, including communication, evidence-based reasoning, and problem solving, as well as uh, proficiencies particular to their fields. So I don't know that most people outside of this room think oh, the way to develop the goals of a liberal arts education are to take more math classes. But I think we should be making that case. I think most people think when they think the liberal arts math class, make sure everyone has basic quantitative reasoning skills and can balance their checkbook. But according to the AAC and you, they should be taking an, an inquiry-based class to develop these, uh, these competencies. Um, I can't see my page numbers. Oh, we already did that one. Um, one, the LEAP challenge has been around for about a decade, and it's, it's moving in this direction of what's called signature work. In signature work, a student uses his or her cumulative learning to pursue a significant project related to a problem she or he defines. And the project conducted throughout at least one semester, the student takes the lead and produces work that expresses insights and learning gained from the inquiry and demonstrates the skills and knowledge she or he has acquired. Faculty and mentors provide support and guidance. So I think this is a model for exactly what we're doing. And the, the final point here, if you find this PDF, is if you look at the seven principles, um, inclusive excellence, teaching the arts of inquiry, I think we are talking about meeting the LEAP challenge. And the AACNU is one of the largest uh, professional organizations seeking to make this happen across higher ed. And, and so they have articulated a need, and I think we have some of the tools to, to help them. And I think we should, we should take that as the beginning of one of those changes that Ed Berger described at Southwestern. Thank you.